as the priest begins his entrance into the sanctuary, he does so in silence, preceded by the server, who represents, in a way, the help that all of the faithful want to give to support the priest in his awesome task and responsibility. The nave represents those who have come in from the world to seek what God alone can give them. The altar rail represents the barrier, the chasm that exists between our sinfulness and the holiness and majesty of God. The priest is the one who mediates between these two realities, who moves from the nave into the sanctuary in order as an instrument to make Christ present. As he begins to do so, there is silence. Silence as he places the chalice, silence as he opens the book to the Mass of the day, silence as he bows his head towards the cross by which we are saved, and only then as he goes down to the bottom of the altar, to the bottom of Calvary, the words begin, and they begin with the invocation of the Holy Trinity, as all creation begins in the presence of the Holy Trinity is carried on through their work in our world and will be brought to fulfillment by their action amongst us. The prayers of the foot of the altar are primarily around a psalm, a psalm which recognizes the goodness that God has made in man and the betrayal of that goodness that man has wrought through sin. The first thing that the priest asks for is mercy. At the conclusion of the dialogue which makes up the prayer of the psalm, the priest begins the confidior in which once again he asks for mercy, but now invoking not only Almighty God, but in a true Catholic spirit the entire court of heaven our Blessed Lady, the angels, the saints, those who are present, and the whole church. He strikes his breast as a sign of his contriteness, and the server, in the name of all of us, implores God's mercy for him. Then the priest stands as witness to the confidior of the server, who asks for those same degrees of mercy and forgiveness and intercession as the priest did, the server now on our behalf. At the conclusion of his confidior, the priest once again invokes God's mercy. How many times, over and over, the reality of our situation before the awesomeness of God needs to be recognized. We sign ourselves with the cross, asking that we may be completely covered, washed by that saving sign. The priest ascends the altar, but now not in silence, because he goes to begin the Mass proper with the words of the introit, and so once again he implores God to take away his sins and asks that through the intercession of the martyrs whose bones lie in the altar, he may be cleansed and made more worthy to celebrate the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Once again, a sign of the cross and in the words of the introit, a reminder that the Psalms, as we had at the beginning of the Mass, and now a portion of the Psalms in the introit, represent a big connection with the daily prayer of the Church in the Divine Office and the recitation of the Psalms. And also we get a glimpse of the theme of the Mass of the day, whether it be of the mystery of our Lord, of an incident in the life of Our Lady, or the saints. The priest goes to the center of the altar and standing before the tabernacle invokes the mercy of God in the ancient Greek words of the Kyrie, a reminder that the Church 
is universal and also a threefold reminder that no matter what we do in the presence of God, it must always begin with an acknowledgement of our sins and a trust and a confidence that the mercy of God will lift us beyond them. Then the priest says the Gloria, which is said only on festival days and not in requiem masses or in seasons of penance such as Advent and Lent. This beautiful hymn is Trinitarian in character and brings us back to the very beginning of Mass with the sign of the cross and takes us beyond it, always in the presence of and through the Trinity. The priest greets the people before he goes to a formal prayer and then says the collect of the day's Mass, which invokes the mystery or the particular saint whose feast is being celebrated. This leads immediately into the Epistle and Gospel, which are read in the ancient language of Latin to signify the unity of the sacrifice of the Mass. We often think of the sacrifice as being the sacrifice of the body and blood of Christ, which is certainly true. But the whole Mass is the one action of Christ which takes us out of mere chronological time and into the single instant of our redemption made present again on the altar in every celebration of Holy Mass. The Epistle and the Gospel instruct, but they do more than instruct us even before that important reality takes place. They are Christ offering to His Father the witness of the truth of revelation. At the conclusion of the Epistle, the gradual and depending on the season, an Alleluia or a tract is recited by the priest and then he goes to the center of the altar to prepare himself to read the words of the Holy Gospel. He asks that he may be cleansed interiorly and exteriorly in order to proclaim those holy words which take us back to the very days and moments and times of the Incarnation. He bows low and prays that God may strengthen him and make him worthy. Then he goes to the Gospel side of the altar where the server has placed the Missal and begins the words of the Holy Gospel. Once again, not merely instruction for us, not merely something to be intellectually comprehended, but a real presence of Christ before which we bow and show our homage and reverence. As the priest comes to the end of the words of the Gospel, he lifts it towards him and kisses the place where he initially made the sign of the cross over the words of Christ. These acts of reverence and homage are repeated both out of deference to the one to whom we address ourselves, but also because being human, we need these moment-by-moment -moment reminders of the awesome character of what is going on at the altar and the kind of devotion that we should have towards them. The priest then, if the Mass is of festival character, begins the words of the Creed with the word credo, I believe. In the most ancient times of the Church, when there was almost universal persecution, the martyrs considered it the crowning grace of their witness to the truth of the faith. If before they fell into unconsciousness, they were able to put a finger into their blood and write on their torn flesh the words, credo, the words which we say even today and will until the end of time. Each person answers on his own responsibility for his belief. Credo, I believe, and it will be on the basis of that belief and his fidelity to it that he will be judged one day before the throne of God. The credo ends as the Gloria did with the sign of the cross, always the reminder throughout Mass that it is through the cross alone that our salvation 
is made real and that all of the truths of revelation are brought into actuality. The priest greets the people once again with the words Dominus Vobiscum and then reads the brief offertory antiphon, which is again a key to the theme of the nature of the particular Mass of the day. His voice then sinks into silence as he begins the offertory. The chalice is unveiled, which is itself a sign that we're entering much more deeply into the mystery of our redemption. The priest offers first the host and then the chalice, invoking ancient words which talk about this pure, immaculate, unspotted host. Some well-meaning but misguided theologians in the past have said that perhaps these words are not very appropriate at this particular point in the Mass because they anticipate the words of sacrifice. At this point, after all, the host is merely a piece of bread and in the chalice it's merely wine and water. But what those good fathers have sometimes forgotten is that in the Mass we are lifted from the limitations of merely chronological human time into the single moment beyond time of the redemption. And so the whole Mass stands as the sacrifice of Christ, the offering of Christ, the oblation of Christ, as he offers his Father the words of the Epistle and the Gospel as the homage of truth, as he offers bread and wine and water as the homage of creation, and later as he will offer during the canon the very body and blood, soul and divinity of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. It's all one action, and so at any given moment it's part of his sacrifice and it is his sacrifice. After the offering, of the host and the chalice, the priest washes his fingers, an external sign of the purity with which the priest should seek to approach the awful mysteries of the altar. He does this again in the context of a psalm, and every priest will once again be reminded that his prayer must be throughout every day in the Divine Office and the reading of the Psalms, those most beautiful and central prayers of the Church, brought to fulfillment in Christ. The priest returns to the altar to once again ask the invocation of Our Lady and the Saints before he again reverences the bones of the martyrs by a kiss and turns to the faithful, asking them to join their sacrifice of praise to his at the altar in prayer. He then returns to face the altar and say the secret prayer, which like most of the other prayers of the offertory, is said in silence. It renews the theme of the Mass of the day and leads into the dialogue which precedes the preface, in which the priest, in a loud voice now, and joins the faithful to lift their hearts to the action at the altar. And not only their hearts, but their whole beings. He reads the words of the preface in a loud voice, summoning the whole church to prayer. And at the conclusion of the preface, he bows his head and very often, in a slightly lowered voice, reads the words of the Sanctus, Holy, 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 bowing before the presence of Almighty God and signing himself yet again with the sign of the cross. Once the Sanctus is over, we have gone from the proclamation, so to say, of the preface to the more subdued words of the acknowledgement of God's 
threefold holiness, and then to the silence of the canon, in which the priest's words become purely instrumental, and before this great mystery all falls into a reverent and devout silence. The priest makes multiple signs of the cross over the oblata, as it were pointing to them with the sign of the cross to show that it is through the cross that our salvation is made real and in the holy sacrifice of the mass made present. This gives the faithful the opportunity to withdraw themselves from their multiple and varying distractions to find their way in multiple ways to a deeper silence and so to be more deeply united than mere words can do to the sacrifice which goes beyond the power of all words. The priest invokes once again the intercession of the saints after he has prayed for those living members of the body of Christ for whom he is particularly offering the Mass and for all of us. And then comes the hank igitur in which the priest places his hands over the oblation and asks that the Holy Ghost may descend in order that the transformation of bread and wine may be made complete into the body and blood, soul and divinity of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. After the hank igitur, there is the quam oblationem, which reminds us that we belong on that paten with Christ, in that chalice with Christ, so that his oblation may be extended to us and we may be offered also to his Father. Here, the movements and gestures of the priest become quite particular and minute, imitating the action of Christ at that first Mass, as Christ makes actual that first Mass. The priest bends over the bread, the host, and says the words of consecration. The ancient fathers of the Church used to say that at this moment it's not so much that Christ merely comes down, but that he lifts us all to the sphere where he lives in glory. Once again, beyond time and the limitations of this world to the very presence of God. The genuflections, the bows, the signs of the cross, the silence, all speak of devotion and reverence before this unspeakable mystery. Most of the same gestures are repeated in the consecration of the wine as the priest bends over the chalice and says silently, devoutly, reverently, attentively those words by which the blood of Christ comes among us and by which we are saved. He shows the host and the chalice to the faithful. In older times, the people would cry out, hold up, hold up so that they could gaze a few more moments on the mystery of their salvation. After the last genuflection, the priest continues the words of the canon, canon which means rule, the rule of prayer, unchanging throughout the centuries and taking us back to the very first Mass as it was celebrated in the upper room. The Council of Trent teaches us that the words of the canon in all their essentials are of apostolic origins and give us what the apostles themselves received from Christ. Though they have been embellished and made even more beautiful through the centuries, the heart of them remains what the apostles heard and what they themselves faithfully gave us. Once again, the priest prays for the faithful, this time the faithful departed. He invokes by name many of the saints 
as so often happens in the extraordinary form of the Mass, to remind us that the communion of saints is a very fundamental reality to which we must always apply ourselves if we hope to receive the strength and the inspiration we need to be faithful to the mysteries that we're privileged to celebrate at the altar. He then will uncover the chalice, lift the host over it, and make several signs of the cross. These movements, these words, though silent, represent a very real offering to God, a homage to God, and a kind of imploring that these gifts, far beyond our making, which we receive and reverence, may be effective unto our everlasting salvation. The priest's fingers from the time of the consecration to the ablutions towards the end of Mass are held together except when he touches the sacred host to show that they have been consecrated for that purpose alone and therefore must touch nothing else. These actions lead us from the end of the canon to the very words and prayer of Christ himself in the Pater Noster, the Our Father. The priest speaks for all of us. Christ prays for all of us. And the priest is instructed by the rubrics to keep his eyes completely on the sacred host as he says these words. When he gets to the end of the Pater Noster, he begins the rite of fraction, the breaking of the host and the mingling of the host and the precious blood. In this prayer, once again, he invokes the intercession of our Blessed Lady and the saints. He signs himself with the paten, which will soon be the resting place of the body of Christ. And then he begins the actual rite of fraction. This mingling of the body and blood of Christ, which signifies the moving of the sacrifice to its completion in the destruction of the victim. Then, after he has completed the fraction, bowing before the mystery which he himself is celebrating, he says the words of the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God, and implores the mercy of God and the peace that can come alone from God for himself and the whole church. Joined to the Agnus Dei, then, are three particular private prayers of preparation for Holy Communion, so filled with doctrinal richness and spiritual truth that any priest could make a complete retreat or maybe several retreats just on the basis of the words in those three prayers as he prepares for the moment of most intimate union with Christ in Holy Communion. When he has finished those prayers, he genuflects, takes the sacred host into his consecrated hands, and then says the threefold, Domine non sum dignus, Lord, I am not worthy. Domine non sum dignus. What a great psychologist the Holy Ghost is, realizing that the first time we say these words, it may be just coming out of some sort of distraction. The second time, we perhaps are a little bit more aware of the summons. And the third time, we hope we can say these words with our whole heart. Then the priest bows low and takes into himself the body and blood, soul and divinity of his Savior. He spends a few moments in silence 
and meditation on the great mystery of this holy sacrament. And then begins the words of the Quidra Triboam, What return shall I make for all that the Lord hath rendered unto me? And the only possible reply to that question is that I will take up the very gift which God himself has given to me, the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. All good gifts come only from the one who has loved us while we were still sinners and sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. The priest carefully and reverently gathers up any stray fragments of the sacred host that lie on the corporal, carefully unites them to the precious blood, and then making the sign of the cross before himself with the precious blood, reverently consumes it. This completes, in the essential way, the sacrifice, the preparation of sorrow for sins, the offering of the victim, and the consuming of the victim. But then the priest makes this indescribable gift available to all of us, carrying out the mission of Christ. We prepare as the priest did with the triple Domine Non Sum Dignus. And then Christ comes to us, overreaching that breach between our sinfulness and his holiness by his own action. And we receive him in an attitude of complete and total docility, reverence, humility, and silence. Finally, as in the moment of Mount Tabor, it's always necessary to come back down the mountain, to come back down from that sphere of the divine into the everyday. And so the vessels must be cleansed, the Blessed Sacrament replaced in the tabernacle for adoration, and the concluding words and actions of the Mass take place. The priest ensures that all traces of the sacred host and the precious blood have been carefully and reverently disposed of. He washes his consecrated fingers which have touched the body of Christ with wine and water, all the time accompanied by the words of prayer. As we draw closer to the conclusion of Mass, the vessels have to be cleansed and once again covered and veiled. After those actions have been done and those prayers have been said, the priest will return to the proper prayers of the Mass of the day. First, the words of the communion antiphon, which remind us of those same words in the introit and the offertory verse of the theme of the Mass of the day. After the priest has veiled the chalice, therefore, he will go to the epistle side of the altar where the missal now stands waiting for him and he will read the words of the communion antiphon. At the conclusion of that antiphon, he returns to the center of the altar and greets the people with the ancient words, Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord be with you. After that greeting, he returns one last time to the missal and there reads the post-communion prayer, which completes the prayer made in the collect and the secret, and which invokes the mystery celebrated in that particular Mass 
or the intercession of the saint whose feast is celebrated on that day. At that point, the priest goes back to the center of the altar, greets the people one more time with the Dominus Vobiscum, and then tells them that the Mass is finished, Ite Misa Est. But as always, when it comes to being in the presence of the God, we do not wish to leave so precipitously. And so the priest tells us to remain for a moment while we receive a blessing. Amen. A blessing given as they all are in and through the sign of the cross by which we are saved. He then turns back and goes to the altar card from which he reads the so-called last gospel, the gospel of the incarnation, the beginning of the gospel of St. John, so that when we leave church to go back into a very challenging and sometimes very difficult existence, we will have the words of the incarnation ringing in our ears to strengthen us and to nourish us and to keep us united to the sacrifice which we have been privileged to assist at during the celebration of Holy Mass. At the central words of the Incarnation and the Word was made flesh, the priest genuflects and we all genuflect with him as an act of homage before this indescribable gift of the Incarnation. The last gospel is then concluded. The priest returns to the center of the altar and bowing to the cross, the priest comes down to the foot of the altar and together with the server and all present says the Leonine prayers, the prayers that were given to the church by Pope Leo XIII and further embellished by Pope Pius XI, which ask for God's mercy on sinners, the exaltation of our Holy Mother the Church in her mission, and the intercession of Our Lady, St. Joseph, and all the saints, asking for God's mercy on the Church, for the salvation of sinners, and for the triumph of the Church's gift to the world. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us, and after this sought exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and our strength, look down with favor upon thy people who cry to thee, and through the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, a blessed Joseph, her spouse, and of thy blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and of all the saints. Do thou These prayers the then conclude with the threefold invocation the to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Church, the same Christ, so As we have been drawn Saint into Michael the heart of the Mass, of so we pray that we may always be enfolded in his Sacred Heart and carried through the ups and downs of daily life into everlasting happiness and union with him in heaven. Once the Leonine prayers have been concluded, the priest then returns to the altar and in a very simple way takes up the chalice, bows his head to the cross one last time, and comes down from the mountain of Calvary, down from the high altar, makes one last genuflection, and now once again the chalice is veiled, the priest is covered, and as he came to the altar, so he leaves in a devout and reverent silence. The Mass is ended, the gift of salvation has come amongst us and been offered to us once again and we go out into the world strengthened, nourished, and ready once again to carry out our duties and responsibilities as faithful Catholics.